Hi everyone. I'm really disappointed with this election. Before this election started, Lee Hsien Loong, Heng Sui Kiat said, let's have a clean election. Let's focus on the issues. And instead, the PAP has rapidly descended into the gutter. Mudslinging, personal attacks, smears, POFMA being thrown around any oh how, uh, imagery of uh, spousal abuse in press statements, and now police reports against Raisha Khan, against a Workers' Party candidate. I, I'm very disappointed. First, the use of POFMA during this election is something I warned about months ago. Instead of having an honest discussion about the issues, POFMA is being used to silence people. A response from the government and from the PAP about the $10 million, pop, uh, sorry, 10 million population issue could have been, okay, let's talk about what is a good level of population. What is a good immigration policy? What is the role of foreigners in our economy? These are important issues to talk about. And instead, we have quibbling over who said exactly what and when. That is not the issue. And instead of having an honest discussion about our response to COVID-19, and about whether we could have done better. Instead, it's, using, it's, it's being used to quibble about the level of politicize, the exact level of politicization and about the, whether or not there was uh, the exact level of consulting of experts by the task force. That is not the important issue. People are dying from COVID-19 and it was, we're arguing over, well, how many experts or what level of consultation you know, th there was in the task force. The PAP candidates also keep throwing around the word falsehood, knowing that there is the weight of law of POFMA behind that word, knowing that it will scare people, intimidate people into being silent, and in particular, scare opposing candidates into being silent. This, this is not a clean election. And as I warned, POFMA makes people fearful to speak, and the PAP de facto gets to brand its opponents liars throughout the whole election period, because any appeal filed now, if you go if you appeal and then go to court, will only take place after polling day. And I believe the use of POFMA by our permanent secretaries is a politicization of our senior civil service. And it is an unfair intervention into our elections by people who are supposed to be impartial. And second, Raisha Khan. And let's be clear, she is speaking truth. She is speaking truth about the, the lived reality of minorities in our country. Uncomfortable, hard, difficult truths about race in our society and how minorities are treated. And how we have treated her demonstrates exactly the problem. It demonstrates exactly her points that minorities, minorities are treated less fairly. They're treated with hostility. Contrast the treatment of Dr. Tan Wu Ming with Rai Shikhan. Khan. And let's, forget, let's not forget that Singapore is officially racist. Lee Kuan Yew set it up that way and was proud about it. Lee Kuan Yew made it very clear he believed Indians and Malays have inferior genes, inferior culture, and government policy needs to reflect this. And he set up a system to, you know, that has pervasive discrimination at all levels because he believed this and he was proud of this. And he justified this throughout his career. And now Ms. Khan, years later, is asking why. And we're angry at her rather than talking about the problem of race in our society, of unequal treatment of minorities. That is not fair to her. Instead of having an honest discussion about race and systemic discrimination, we are smearing a young woman who has the courage to ask difficult questions of ourselves and hold an, uh, an uncomfortable mirror up to ourselves while letting a middle-aged Chinese man go unchallenged. This is the PAP Singapore. And let's not forget, even good people like Taman, like Louis Ng, are remaining silent. Because this is the strength of their internal discipline. This is the moral bankruptcy of the PAP. This is the sheer hypocrisy of the PAP. When good people remain silent, evil wins. And this is where the PAP is today. This is what they're doing to our election. This is where Singapore is today. We can be better if we demand that our politicians are better. 
So I urge all of you Singaporeans, this is your one chance. Every five years, we get one chance. Don't waste it. Demand a clean election on the issues. No smears, no mudslinging, no gutter politics. Focus on the issues. Demand that candidates talk to you about the things which actually matter to our lives. We deserve better. And it's up to us to demand better, responsible people in government because we have the right to something better. So with that in mind, I welcome today Mr. Tan Ji Se of the Singapore Democratic Party. And we are going to talk about the most important issue perhaps facing Singapore right now, the economy. We're not going to talk about personal issues or any gossip about anything or, or you know, we're not even going to bother talking about POFMA because really I am sick of this stupid subject. It's, I've already made my, my opinions clear, right? We're going to talk about the economy because that's what's important. So, welcome. Hi, welcome, Mr. DJ. Tan. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, and thank you very much for, for, for joining us. Yeah. And as I made clear, we're just going to, let's get straight to it. Yeah. Let's talk about the economy. Let's talk about your party's platform, especially the four yeses. Yes, right. I'll be glad to do so. In fact, Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan did ask, mm -hmm. how are we going to finance it? Right. All right. How we are going to finance it? Mm -hmm. So let me go straight to the point. Yes. I'm very surprised with, well, Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan is not very competent with numbers. But I'll explain to him that we, what these proposals are and how we are going to finance it. There are basically three major initiatives under the SDP program. Right. First is about suspension of GST okay. until the end of 2021. Second, it is about retirement income for people, retirees over 65. And thirdly, it's about retrenchment benefits for those at half of last drawn salary. Right. All right. So these three, the first one, GSC suspension will cost about, based on 2020 figures, will cost about 11, uh, slightly over $11 billion. And the second one, uh, retirement income will cost about $2.8 billion. And the third one, retrenchment benefits about $2 billion. So okay. we are basically looking at a total of $16.1 billion. $16.1 billion. And this will not come out of taxes. Okay. This will not come out of taxes. They will come out, we intend to make greater use, fuller use of the returns on our reserves. Right. Based on the figure in the 2020 budget, um, we will have a return of more than $37 billion from the investments of our reserves. We invested, we have huge reserves which are invested and they generate substantial income uh, returns. So, based, because and half of this, the government policy is to put aside half of, up to half of this, half of the returns to the annual budget. In the 2020 budget, they have put aside $18.6 billion, which means to say, since this is being at least uh, up to half, it does mean that we have a revenue a returns on the reserves of at least 17 point, 17 billion, seven, uh, 37 point, 37, over 37 billion. All right, 37 billion, 37.2 billion dollars. Right. So it's basically 18.6 multiplied by 2. Right. So it's about 37.2 billion dollars. So we do have an extra, a balance of $18.6 billion to spend. Okay. And the three programs of the SDB come up to only 16.1. So there's more than enough in the returns on our investments that will pay for these three programs. And leaving behind, even then we will have a balance of $2.5 billion after spending on right. this. And mind you, that's a, a, a great some, a big sum of money that we can use for other purposes as well. Right. Um, okay, okay. So, when I interviewed Paul, yeah. he said you were brilliant in economics, yeah. you were an economics policy wonk, and right out of the gate, you give me a lot of numbers, yeah. um, and you know, you've lived up to your reputation. But let's, let's take it, let's slow it down, let's take it bit by bit for our audience, many yeah. of whom probably, uh, in, you know, including myself, will start to uh, our heads will start to swim if you throw too many big numbers okay. at us. GST, the first thing, mm -hmm. all right? What is 
your vision, SDP's vision uh, for the uh, in terms of taxation yeah. and the role of a regressive consumption tax like the GST as part of taxation, and if I can, you know, then ask also what the broader your your party's broader stance about taxation and the different mix yeah. of taxes. Yeah. But let's start with GST. Um, you you want to freeze GST, right? I think Manu uh, Baskaran, the economist, said yesterday that uh, a hike in GST is a bad idea in this post yeah. or you know ongoing pandemic environment where we're uh, going to likely to see a lot more economic fluctuations. Mm-hmm. But what is uh, what is y- your position? Long term on GST and its role in society and in consumption taxes. Yes, uh, I am not in favor of GST because it is, it is regressive. Right. There are other ways of raising tax, but GST is not one of them. It is very efficient. It's good for the civil service because it's efficient. Right. You don't have to think too much. Just levy a, a, a an overall tax level, and then you get tax at the point of consumption. Right. But it's regressive. It hurts the poor. Those who are those who can least afford it, all right? The government says that most of it comes from the well-to-do, maybe 70%. But then you also have the 30% who are most vulnerable and they are paying a disproportionately high level of tax to the government. If you want to tax the rich, there are other ways of taxing the rich. My point is that we do not need a GST. Even the returns, if you look at it, the returns on our reserves, the government has not disclosed what the amount of reserves is, yeah. but I have estimated that it is at least a trillion dollars, one thousand billion dollar, and they have projected at the long term mm-hmm. return of let's say four percent. Four percent means forty billion dollar every year, and by their own admission, in twenty twenty, they have by implication indicated a revenue of at least thirty seven point two billion dollar. All right, 37.2 billion. We have more than enough to take care of our social program. No need to have GST because it's regressive. Mm-hmm. And the SDP has taken a very conservative approach, suspended it only for this and next year. So, but if you look at the long-term figure on an investment on the reserves, I'm prepared to, to, to project that we don't, need, we don't need any GST at all to, to, for our tax revenue. So that's one thing. Um, okay, is yeah. there a role for consumption taxes, say, on luxury goods? If we're talking about uh, income redistribution of compensating the losers, you know, people who are who end up being um, exploited by the global economy, who lose out from the yeah. globalized economy, is there a role for consumption taxes in in that mix? Say, like in the UK, where yeah. you know I I live for many years. Uh, Things which are considered luxuries are taxed, right? Yeah. Uh, whereas daily necessities are not taxed. Is there a role there? Well, let's take at the overall picture of taxes. Yeah. Public finance. Government raises tax to finance public services. Right. You don't just simply raise tax for the, for the purpose of raising tax and putting it into your reserves. You raise tax to finance public services like education, public security, policing, employing police, and all that, and to defend ourselves for defense expenditure. These are the common public goods, public services that that no single individual can afford. You cannot hire your own policeman to protect you. You cannot hire a soldier to protect the country, mm-hmm. and you cannot hire a teacher mm-hmm. uh, uh, to build a own school to or educate doctor, your children. Right? You uh, yeah, and you don't have to go yeah. to a hospital rightly. So you cannot hire your own doctor. Expensive to those, and that is why there is tax, tax for all to finance these public services. But beyond that, we should not levy any tax at all. Is there a room for tax on the wealthy, uh, uh, consumption of luxury goods? Yes and no. If we need taxes, then obviously it should not hurt those who are weak, who are economically vulnerable, who can least afford those taxes. So if you need income, if the government needs income, to tax, to, to finance public services, rightfully it should come from those who can afford it and the rich, the wealthy can afford it. And uh, they can afford to pay, let's say, 7% on their Lamborghini, their <laughs> Porsche and all that. Uh, it's no, I mean, it doesn't really affect them. 
But frankly speaking, if you look at our reserves and the returns that they generate, we don't need even to tax the rich. Uh, that is why the SDP3 proposals that cost $16.1 billion, none of it will come from the taxes. Okay? Right. There is no need to increase any tax or introduce any tax, or not, no need even to tax the wealthy. You know? it's, uh, it's, you know, it is the traditional left-wing party policy to tax the rich to help the poor. Right? So, because the rich can afford it. But I think in our particular situation, we don't need to do so. And frankly, they are just, the government just wanting to paint the picture of SDP as a tax and spend party. Mm. But we are not going to tax people because the figures show that we don't need taxes to finance our social program. Okay, so when you say we don't need taxes, you mean we don't need new or increased yeah. taxes, but we will still have income tax. That's right. Right. Well, um, this is a bit outside your, your four yeses, yeah. but our level of income tax is quite notoriously very low compared to the developed world and basically half or less than half of what it was when we were yeah. uh, you know, a far poorer country in the 70s and 80s. So what, what about income tax um, and this argument about making Singapore more "Quote unquote competitive through a lower income tax and shifting the burden then onto more onto consumption taxes." That is the rationale. That is yeah. the rationale for lowering the income tax uh, on individuals and corporations, and that is why GST was introduced. Mm -hmm. And it's a bad deal. It is a bad bargain as far as the economy is concerned because it's inflationary. It hurts the poor, and frankly, uh, we don't need to lower our tax rate to, so, to such a low level as to attract investment. Look at a lot of the Western developed countries, their tax rates are quite high. Right. And the people have not become lazy, you know, and they, they, they work hard and, well, they increase the taxes to finance social programs in the West, especially in the European, Northern European countries. But the people have not become lazy, mm. right? That's the argument. So that to lower tax, people will work hard for their own personal incentive to work hard for their own personal gain. But we don't need that. We don't need that. We are quite a different society. People understand the need to work hard to earn their own keep in society. Mm. The problem for this deal that you increase, that is why we have to increase the GST to make up for the loss of income revenue from taxes on corporations and on individuals. We don't need such a bargain, we don't need such a deal because we really don't need it. The numbers suggest that we don't need it, all right? Mm -hmm. So, yes, our taxes are a bit on the low side, but it's okay. We can make up, not from increasing consumption tax, from, from fuller use of the returns on the investments of our reserves. Right. Okay, so this is quite, quite startling to me because what I'm hearing from you is actually really conservative in a yeah. way you're not proposing a drastic reform of the tax system mm. or new taxes or really a massive reshaping of how we use our taxes. Yeah. You're just saying, let's take the money we're already earning from our reserves right. and instead of hiding away half of it, let's utilize it, and even, not even all of it, but let's utilize it for social transfers and welfare programs. Yes. Yes, you know, it's like just spending the interest income on yeah. our fixed deposits in the bank. Yeah. You know, you, you can get a few percent, you have a fixed deposit, then you are just spending the returns without touching the principal. The same principle applies to the use of the returns on our reserves. We are spending only the returns, like the interest income on our reserves. No need to have any, no need to touch the principal. The government is always accusing people of trying to raid the reserves and all that. You know, but this is not going to happen. In fact, that's not all because we have another buffer, a big buffer in the form of revenue from sale of uh, land leases. You know, in the past 10 years, we have sold land and generated revenue of $16 billion every year, one six. Over the past 10 years, we have generated $160 billion, $16 billion every year which is enough to pay for a lot of things. You know, I have mentioned about the return on our reserve, which is by the government's account at least $37.2 billion. 
So this one is enough for our social program. But added to it is another 16 billion from the sale of state land leases. And that's a lot of money to finance our own uh, programs. More future-oriented training programs, more schools, smaller classrooms, smaller class size and all that. So wait, right now, what is that money used for? This 16 billion a year from the sale of land leases. I, I mean, I don't know, and, and, and I can't, you know, question that number or anything. Yeah. I have no idea. So, uh, I, I, you know, I accept your. This is the number, and you, yes. you, you mean you used to be a senior, very senior civil servant. So you know better than I do. But what do we use that money for? Yes, it is not being used right now. Um, right now, what the government does is to put every revenue from the sale of state land leases directly into the reserves, you know, not using it. Oh. The IMF has always questioned the rationale for doing so because under the IMF accounting framework, revenue from the state sale of state land leases can go directly to current revenue and be used. This is what other countries are doing. Hong Kong, for example, uses uh, pays for its pays for its current budget with about 70% coming from the sale of land, sale of land leases. But the Singapore government, instead of being uh, following international best principles of accounting, has its own set of accounting by diverting everything from land sales, revenue from land sales into the reserves directly, not allowing it to be used for current purposes. And what's the rationale for doing that? The, the government's rationale, the PAP's rationale? Yeah, the rationale, if you ask me, is an unspoken one. They want to hide the reserves. They, want to, they do not want people to know that we have a lot of, lots of money, lots of money in the reserves. And they are afraid, if I can remember my days, well, maybe it's also public, but in the, service we use, in the civil service, they used to hear it. Don't ever tell people we have too much money because then there will be pressure on, P on the government to spend money. I think this is also brought up in public by the late Prime Minister, Mr Lee Kuan Yew. He's always afraid that people have too much money and put pressure on the government to have free health care, free social welfare program. So this is what the developed countries have done. I mean, they use tax revenue to finance, uh, to subsidise health care a lot, subsidise education a lot. NHS in UK is totally free. Healthcare is totally free. Yeah, you so, don't need to tell me that. I yeah. had a lot of healthcare <laughs> from the NHS because you know I have chronic yeah. skin problems. So this is the thing. We have a lot of money in the reserves, and the reserves are our money. Yeah, it's taxpayers' money. Why are they hiding it? Why are they squirreling it away? You know, hoarding it. It's our money. Land sales, although the people are paying it through higher cost of HDB flats because they do charge HDB flats, they do the land, the land price, all right? Mm -hmm. The sales of land to the pub, to, even to private corporations and individuals, that adds on to the cost of doing business. Your shopping malls, the rental of shopping malls, industries, right. that add to the cost and you are paying for it. Right. It is a cost and yet the sale, the revenue from land sale has not gone to benefit people directly. Mm. It's gone directly into reserves. This is where the injustice of it is. Lots of money being hidden away, being hoarded. And I'm only asking for the use on the return on the investment of the reserves. Wow, okay, okay. So basically, I mean, you're saying that the, the government has all this property that it leases out yeah. and these leases are for how long? Well, usually 99-year 99 99 year lease, but there are some industrial land that yeah. is being leased out for 60 years, yeah. some for 50, 30, uh, it varies, okay. it varies. Like even for the dormitories for foreign workers, I think it's only 30 years or 20 years, right. okay? So, some people objected to the use of revenue from land sales to finance current expenditure is like they say you are selling away the family jewels. I mean, basically the the uh, you are selling away the country because you are selling land. But you are selling leases. away the exactly. You are right. These are only leases yeah. because at the end of ninety year ninety nine years, the land reverts back to state ownership. Yeah. the people still own it. Yeah. 
yeah. all right they may not own the lease they may uh, corporations own the 99 year lease 50 year lease 60 year lease but the end of 20 years like for example foreign worker dormitories they become state land again and we can sell it again so we are not selling of our country yeah i mean and also it's not like someone can literally if you sell the land someone can literally pick up the land yeah. and take it away to another country it's still there it's still there exactly yes. it's still there and it's generating income for us right so we should not be afraid of using it it is part of our asset our asset deployment Wow, okay, so on top of, so it's like, I, I feel like I'm being screwed over multiple times here because you have this land, right, and the government is, is, is leasing it out and taking all the money and putting it in the reserves yeah. and that drives up costs on, you know, and then it, it drives up costs for me because that land is, is then, the cost of it is passed on uh, to the consumer, yeah. but also it's then that money is not used to subsidize. So I could have had far lower healthcare costs, That's right. right? I could have had uh, lower living costs because of this. So I feel like doubly screwed over. On the one hand, the social welfare is not subsidized to the extent it can be subsidized. On the other hand, I'm paying more uh, as a consumer when I go to these malls or whatever. That, I mean, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> That's right. right. That is why the government doesn't want to know, let you know uh, the, the size of the reserves and doesn't want to make use of the uh, revenue from sale of state land. Okay. Well, let's talk about the reserves because this is actually a very interesting issue. And recently, I think it was on academia.sg, Manu Baskaran and Linda Lim, two incredibly well-respected uh, economists, respected not just by us, but by the PAP government, globally world-famous, argued that this strategy of keeping large reserves and having this very conservative fiscal spending is regressive in that it doesn't benefit us now, but it doesn't even benefit future generations, right? Because in future generations, you, you have access to other sources of funding. Uh, and at the same time, it denies current generations the fund to spend in time of crisis. Right. And Manu, last night in the New Narrative Watch Party, actually said the question, that there's, you know, the idea that debt is bad is is too simplistic, it's wrong. There is an optimal level of debt that yes. government should carry. Carrying no debt can be worse and may be worse than carrying some debt, right? So Manu and Linda argued that the Singaporean government should consider taking more of the reserves and leverage on its high credit rating to borrow at affordable rates, right? In order to fund more expansive social programs. Mm -hmm. So what's your thinking on this? What's your... and um, what do you think a, an optimal strategy on the reserves should be? Well, I think uh, there is room. I agree totally with uh, Dr. Linda Lim and Manu Baskaran on this matter that we should make greater use of our good credit standing to raise money from the market, from the bond markets, you know, and then uh, pay for long-term interest rates, which is quite low now, which is quite low now. We don't need to tax people. To, to, to finance all the social program. All right, there's no need, there's absolutely no reason to increase GIC from seven to 9% to finance long-term care. They always said, you know, the elderly population becoming more aging, more older, so you need more money to finance. The money is there, you, there is no need to increase taxes. As for borrowing, yes, not, we, we don't need to borrow to finance current as consumption. What we need to do is to borrow long term to finance long term development plans like you know, uh, infrastructure, Changi Airport Terminal 5, um, the port development at Tuas, at Kranji into the future. These are long term development plans that need long term capital. We can raise money from the market, loans, and then to finance that over the long term because this projects, this development project benefit future generation. Mm -hmm. So the money should not come from current generation to pay for future generation. And the the future generation should pay it through their to the interest to paying the interest on all these loans in right. future. Now from my admittedly simplistic understanding, I mean my father's an accountant but I am terrible with numbers, but would I be correct in saying if you can borrow money at a low rate, you're yeah. actually, and then you invest it, and you know that down the road, you're going to get a better return on it than the interest rate, you're actually making a profit. 
then it's better to borrow that money and invest it than to use your own capital to invest? Or is that too simplistic? Well, I think you must be very careful about that. Yeah. We should never borrow to invest. We must only invest with our extra money. All right? Okay. Yes, uh, it'd be very good if somebody could lend you money to invest, but uh, you must have some collateral. Right. All right, you must have come collateral, otherwise the banks will go bankrupt. Okay. So it is always good because there is, uh, you know, there is an investment term that people use like getting a carry, let's say you borrow in yen at a low interest rate and then to buy something at a, that gives you a better yield, Australian dollar, US dollar, and then you just, uh, you just pay. Basically. But then you are taking a risk with the exchange rate. So all investments come with risk. I wouldn't recommend people to borrow money to invest. Mm -hmm. You must invest your own money. Mm -hmm. And borrowing, which will be just maybe an investment strategy, but it must be collateralized. Right. It must be collateralized. You must have the money in the first place. The money you can afford to lose, rather than money you, can, you don't have money, and then when the market turns against you, mm -hmm. you go bankrupt or, or you okay. whatever it is. Okay, okay. Well. Don't take financial advice from me, guys. Um, so, so just help me understand then, when you borrow money at low interest rates to invest in these big infrastructure projects, right? Um, what you're saying is, would I be correct? Correct me if I'm wrong, right? It, it's, it's more about a trade-off. Instead of using the current money to do these long-term infrastructure projects, it's better to borrow at the lower interest rates and use the current money for... Um, sort of current purposes is is would that be an? I'm just trying to understand, you know, how yeah. this whole concept, because I live in this environment where the you, you constantly hear the PAP propaganda about it's it's bad to borrow money. We need to use our reserves. So I'm just trying to understand the this economic argument. Also, I'm hearing from Manu and Linda and and uh, you know other like IMF and all that that it, low levels of debt are actually optimal. So can, can you help me understand that? Well, I think it is, um, you know, uh, there is this concept of cost of equity and cost of debt. Mm -hmm. if, it is, if the cost of debt borrowing is lower than the cost of your own money of equity, then obviously you should borrow. I mean, we are talking not, it is not really speculative investment in, the, in, in capital development projects of the country, like building an airport and expanding the airport or expanding the port. These are real good projects, I mean, for, to look into the long-term future of the country. So right. you can borrow money, especially when you, your, your credit uh, worthiness is very high and you just pay very low interest rate. So obviously, you, as the best is to have a lot of money, yeah. right? Don't have to borrow. Yeah. But if you have to make a decision, a choice between uh, financing it with your own money and totally with your own money or financing maybe half, maybe a portion of your own money and the balance with debt, you should consider that. I mean, it's portfolio balancing and, and all that, how to maximize interest on your funds. Right. Right? right, right. It is, of course, not rational uh, not to borrow money when, you're, when the cost is so low to you. I mean, it's, I mean, if you don't have to pay any interest at all on borrowing, why not use other people's money, you know? Right. Right, right, right. Okay, I get, I get that. Yeah. Okay, okay. So let's come back then to this, which actually, I'm, 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 I have to admit, I'm quite startled. Very conservative plan of yours, uh, of the SDPs, which is just use the returns on the reserves yeah. to fund expansion of social welfare or freeze GST. Yeah. Let's talk about the, the second yes, which is about retrenchment benefits. Yes. Yeah. So, can you talk more about your plans there and uh, and what they mean for Singaporeans? I think retrenchments are going to become more and more frequent because of distortions to the international economy, disruptions to the international by either through technology or epidemics, healthcare epidemics, or more geopolitical tension. Right? China, U.S. Uh, trade tension and. Uh, activity in the South China Sea, which can disrupt uh, trade and investment flows. So disruptions are going to be more frequent in future. Mm -hmm. So jobs will not be certain, will not be so stable. So it is important 
that we uh, we provide uh, anchors against uh, these disruptions. Mm -hmm. The first anchor, obviously, is to make sure that their lives, the lives and income of workers, are not severely affected. Right? They have put in so much of their 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 skills, their future, their work into their job, and then suddenly, because through no fault of theirs, technology, health epidemic, or geopolitical tension, they lose their jobs. So we they need protection because every family has got commitments. Your mortgages, your school fees for the children, and all the health care. They have commitments, and it is important that when they lose their job, they don't lose their income completely. So that is why the SDP has this program of making sure that retention benefits at at least half drawn salary. You know, right. is basically for the first six months, seventy five percent of your last ones. If you were earning two thousand dollars. You should get seventy-five percent, which is what thousand five hundred dollars a month, mm -hmm. so that you can still live life as normally as possible. Not so normal, but twenty-five percent less normal. Then the next six months, when you are still unemployed, then you get half of your last one's salary. Let's say a thousand instead of two thousand, and for the final six months at twenty-five percent, so one quarter. So this is to put pressure on people to go really go and look for a job. Don't just sit at home and enjoy the retention benefits. But over eighteen months, you have an average of fifty percent of your last drawn salary every month. All right. Okay. So and this program will cost about two billion dollar. Oh, that's all. Yeah, that's all because not everyone will get retrenched. Right. <laughs> uh, that because civil servants will not get retrenched. Right. Uh, the ministers will not get retrenched; they can only get no. voted out. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so, a lot of them will still keep their jobs, but we are right. talking about the vulnerable people, those who are in rather sensitive sectors, who are not in stable yeah. sectors. Health stable sectors are in the social services, healthcare, and education. These are very stable sectors. Mm -hmm. So, but there are other se sectors which are not stable, which are not stable. And these are the people who need to be protected. Okay. So it costs only two billion dollar. By our calculations, is two billion dollar a year. That's a retrenchment package. Right. It seems quite. Uh, I mean, just hearing that number, it seems like a damning reflection on Singapore that people earn so little that a retrenchment package at fifty percent of last drawn salary is only two billion. Mm -hmm. Uh, my immediate question is, how do you calculate last drawn salary in, and this is a question I keep asking people, in this globalized economy where people have multiple sources of income, some of which aren't, uh, you know, either declared yeah, or liable yeah. for CPF, and uh, where people might have income from multiple sources in yeah. different countries because you're freelance, uh, you know, or you're just gigging. I have friends who are, you know, who have a regular job, but then they also do side gigs yeah, yeah. like creative work or whatever. So in this, uh, you know, you talk about the changing nature of the economy, and what we're also seeing is because of the pandemic, a lot more work is going to be remote work. There's going to be a lot more opportunity for freelance work uh, and even before the pandemic the world was going towards a place where many people weren't having those same weren't in a regular workplace weren't having the kind of regularized protections uh, you know and uh, with a fixed workplace and a, and a sort of uh, you know all those all those rules that that people with stable jobs I mean with with fixed yeah. sort of jobs have yeah so how do you account yes. for that yes it's not easy yeah. especially people have to live on multiple jobs now especially those in the gig economy. But so long as we produce, you are able to produce evidence of income, mm -hmm. then it adds up. All right. these jobs add up. And I think we should trust the people. I mean, to declare, to accept them for what they are, they declared. I don't think people will abuse and cheat the system, provided the system is fair to them. They will not cheat. Mm. If, we, if the system question them, question their honesty, their honor, we must work on an on, what they call an honor system based on a person's honour, to declare honesty. If the state is honest and fair to them, to the people, the people will in return be fair and honest in their dealings with the state. That's natural, that's human. Right. 
yeah. there will still be people who will abuse the system. There is, there is no 100% uh, guarantee that everyone will be honest. They, they deserve a million dollar, mm. right? They may be earning a lot of money as a doctor, as a lawyer, but this is public service. Yeah. You are abusing public service based on your last drawn salary. Yeah. Right? Okay, this, this, this to me is maybe might be the biggest difference because fundamentally, between you and the PAP, because fundamentally the PAP and their policies proceed from a position of we don't trust you we don't trust what you say. No. Uh, we treat c citizens with suspicion. Uh, we assume that everyone is out to scam the system. Yeah. And, you know, it's that old joke about in the SAF, there's a rule 11, don't get caught, yeah. right? But if you don't get caught, that somehow legitimizes it, which is the opposite of a good citizen. A good citizen, regardless of whether you get caught, regardless of whether there's a rule, tries to be a good citizen to work for the, yeah. honestly and for the benefit of the community. And that sort of mentality starts at the top, right? Yeah. If you act like you trust citizens, citizens will respond. Mm. So I think this is really, this is, hearing you say that actually is the biggest value difference between uh, someone I've interviewed and the PAP, yeah. right? In, in all these interviews and indeed this whole election campaign. Um, and you know, it yeah. is not only me who has uh, Mr. Lee Kuan, the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew did mention yeah. how civilized the British were when he was a student there. Mm -hmm. That you know, people could just pick up a newspaper from the public stand and just drop a coin to mm -hmm. pay for the public news. He considered that civilized, but somehow he didn't think that we were civilized enough uh, mm -hmm. that we will not abuse the that abuse the system because he saw it when he was a student in the UK. Remember that he mentioned that. But I think we should trust the people. Uh, I, I was also, as a student in the UK, I was also impressed with how the people, you know, you know when I uh, went to the shop, the department store to buy something, they will ask me whether I'm a student. I say, I'm a student. You say, okay, no need to show identification. You say you're a student, we accept you're a student, you, you get this concession. Mm -hmm. So no need to show your IC, your identity card. So yeah. that, that's the system that they have there. And the other thing you, 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 you uh, made me remember is actually, uh, I think it was out of a recent study about, uh, you know, that Tio Yu Yen and others did about income uh, and the minimum income necessary yeah. and how the PAP is really focused on this small tiny group of people who cheat the system. But there's also, what about a group of people who really do need the help and then their pai say they don't ask for the help, yeah. right? Because they feel they have dignity, they have pride, yeah. they don't want to, you know, they don't want to consume, let other people have this yes, welfare yes, who need yes. it more. Those people need the help too. And we never worry about people who are not consumed. We always assume that people who need help are going to ask for it. But yeah. in Singapore, that is not true for a lot of reasons. Yeah. You know, and it's in some, sometimes it's not even, they want to ask for help, but there are barriers. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm just uh, I'm, I'm yeah, talking about this very exciting. Yeah. Of my own experience as a student, I was I think I was in primary two, and um, there was this free textbooks being given, and uh, asking my teacher used to my teacher asked me, hey, he said why do you do you do you are eligible for this free textbooks? Why don't you apply for them? Huh? You apply and we will give you free textbooks, but. Um, well, I say, well, there are limited quantities of free textbooks. I think I don't need them. I can afford them. And frankly, we were so much poorer than so many other people. I mean, my mother was a washerwoman and all that. And uh, we could do with some free textbooks. But because, I mean, my mother used to tell me, don't let others who deserve it, who are poorer than us, take those free textbooks. Right. So, um, okay, we're kind of... Uh, taking a lot more time than I thought. This has been a really interesting conversation. I've learned a lot about reserves. So uh, let's just quickly talk about your $500 a month for yeah. retirees. Okay. How did you come up with that number and what's the basis for this policy? Oh, I think basically $500 a month for the elderly. Uh, I think it's something that will help them. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, this TOUE's survey has shown yeah, that yeah. Uh, the, a lot of elderly depend on their children to contribute to their 
minimum spending. I think you need to calculate the minimum minimum spending of third one thousand three hundred seventy nine dollars. Yes. And they have only about eight hundred dollars from the CPF uh, minimum sum. Uh, so they need about another five hundred dollars, and they get it from their children. So if the state were to give them five hundred dollars, then they will have a they will be able to achieve a minimum spending of about one thousand three hundred seventy nine dollars, uh, which is what Miss Steele uh, suggested, right? Eight hundred dollars from their own seat from the people CPF, yeah. Pro, pro, ah, pro, sorry, pro, Professor Teo, right. Professor Teo, um, and I think that is the figure. That is why. We think that uh, five hundred dollars will lift the burden of children having to look after their elderly parents. Okay, and uh, this is just universal. Oh yeah, anyone that is above sixty-five uh, years old will get it. Okay. Obviously, there will be a lot of wealthy people who do not need it, yeah. but they can always contribute back to charity, right? Or they can even pass on to their poorer cousins or their poorer relatives. That's okay, you know. I'm not uh, against giving some tax benefits or grants to the rich. After all, they pay a lot of taxes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they deserve some return too. You know, yeah. uh, they pay a lot of taxes. Uh, they may be driving Lamborghini, but they pay tax on their Lamborghini. So they we deserve to give some back to them. Five hundred dollars. They don't need it, uh, but it's good to know that they are being appreciated. And they can give it back to charity, or give to the poorer relatives, or to just to the neighbors' son, children coming to wish them, and then just buy some sweets for them or whatever. Right, right, right okay. And okay. mind you, this five hundred dollars is not wasted. They most people will just spend, like those who are retrenched, five, mm -hmm. with their last one salary, half of last one salary, and the five hundred dollars will be spent in the local economy. I mean, they will go to the hawker center, they will go to the bakeries, and then they will spend in the supermarket. And they will help make local economy more vibrant in the restaurants, the food court, the hawker centers, supermarkets, uh, markets, and bakeries. They will become more vibrant. The problem with our current local neighborhood uh, in the estate is that they are quite dead, yeah. dead in the daytime. You get only people who come back from work to to visit them in the evening, and some hawker centers are only are only active, are only busy in the morning and lunchtime. Evenings they are completely dead. So if you have this money for the elderly, five hundred dollars, maybe twenty dollars a day, you know, they can go to the can spend something for a bowl of laksa, um, for a plate of Hokkien mee char kway teow, and then help the economy. Go for a massage. Uh, go for a massage. Everyone why not? Deserves a good massage. <laughs> uh, you know, and this this reminds me of the same principle that like local communities in the in Europe, uh, the U UK, US, they try and create their own local currency to try and stimulate local expenditure and local spending yeah. while keeping the the money circulating in the local yeah, economy. Yeah. But of course, a government can do that because. We have our own currency. It's called the Singapore dollar, yeah. right? So if you give people five hundred Singapore dollars, they're going to spend it within Singapore. It's not you can't take five hundred Sing and just immediately leave the country yeah, and yeah, spend yeah. it. Yeah, yeah it well, really when stimulates. Well, you're over sixty-five, local. you can't travel too much. Yeah, especially <laughs> now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so before we take questions, let's quickly uh, talk about the last thing. The last yes is responsible governance. Yes. Where uh, you know this is this is maybe the the vaguest thing. So can you tell us a bit more what what you mean with that well, last yes? Actually, it's governance. Yeah. Like holding an election during the pandemic mm. is not putting people first. All right, the people's health must come first. Whatever. Talk of getting a strong mandate that you do not know how long this will last. This the pandemic. That's our excuses. Yeah. Those are all excuses. If you put people first, all these others are secondary. You know, all these other questions, all these other issues are secondary. In fact, the pandemic may just go away in the next few months. Who knows? It may last for another year. The epidemic, the flu virus, will continue to be with us like the common flu. It is been with us for. What time in memorial? Since time in memorial, so were the were this COVID nineteen virus. We will find a, a vaccine probably in another year or so, and then that will help us. But in the meantime, we can practice rules on safe distancing, wearing of masks. We don't need an election now. Mm. 
that is not pooping people first. That is pooping the part PAP's party interest first. They are going to use this uh, election to get to totally wipe out the opposition. Uh, because people will fear they are asking for unity, to be united behind the government, and they're throwing a hundred billion dollars of our own savings to 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 entice the people to vote for the government. So this is not putting people first. This is putting the party's interest above the people's interest, above the people's health care. Right. So let's let's face the hard reality. The P PAP will win. They always yeah. win. We know the election is unfree, unfair, even in the best of times. Now with POFMA, with this pandemic, right, it is a very, very unfair election. If you get elected in the parliament, what can the SDP actually do? What concrete steps can you do as the opposition, you as the opposition, yeah. one seat, to make a difference? We will definitely pursue our four whys and one no. Mm -hmm. All right, the three initiatives with the financial uh, implications, which is which we are prepared to fight for in Parliament. But the immediate one is with regards to COVID-19. We want to make sure that the $100 billion that the government says is going to spend is spent properly and benefit the people who need help most, not big corporations, not subsidiaries of the massive GLCs or whatever. So it must go to the people who need them most. Someone within the government, a government MP, said that the people are getting about an average of $23,000 from this $100 billion package. But do you get it? Do you feel it that you're getting $23,000? Well, not me. I, don't know about you. <laughs> I saw my bank account, it increased by $600 plus $300 plus $100, yeah. $1,000. Far, a far cry from $23,000. All right. How do they calculate this twenty-three thousand? Well, they're just using a hundred billion dollar divided by the population of citizens, and then twenty-three thousand dollars. Right, right, right. That's st that's uh, statistics <laughs> for you. Right, right. So, the first thing that we'll do in Parliament is to make sure that this hundred billion dollars goes is properly spent and goes to the people who need them most. Then the other thing is about the jobs creation. They promise creating a hundred thousand jobs and traineeships. We want to make sure that there are real jobs, permanent jobs, not short-term traineeships of three to six months, you know, that do not lead to real jobs at the end. We have lots of training programs, Skills Future and all that. Have they led to real jobs? Have they led to real jobs, permanent jobs? This is something that we want to fight for. By real jobs, I mean basically they can create, as I, my economic plan, I recommended this nine years ago in my first economic plan for Singapore, that they should generate jobs, double the jobs in healthcare and double the jobs in education. So right now, and the two together will generate another 70,000, uh, 120,000 jobs because we have about 50,000 teachers now and 70,000 healthcare personnel. So 120, if you double them up, uh, then you get 120,000 jobs. These are real permanent jobs. We can always have more uh, beds in hospital mm -hmm. so that to cut down waiting time for the people. And we can also have a small, more schools so that we can have smaller class size to benefit those who are academically weaker. You know, instead of the current IP program, integrated program in schools, benefits, I mean, is designed to benefit those who are academically stronger. The class size is only about 20 to 25 yeah. for an IP program. These are already academically stronger students. But for the average classroom, it's about 40 students. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the normal academic, whatever. Uh, but the IP program is more, more they are the academic stronger. They need less help. The people who need help more are those who are academically weaker now, mm -hmm. who are in your normal secondary schools. So we should reduce, reduce by half from 40 students to 20 students per class. And we can do so by doubling the number of teachers and doubling the number of schools. So this is good for the economy if oh, we that, do that so. That's a big long-term investment. Yeah, that will be a long-term investment. Yeah. Okay. But, but we can start now. Yeah, it seems to me there's a lot of empty buildings out there as yeah, well. Yeah, Every time yeah. I walk through a mall, I'm like, why can't we repurpose these exactly. spaces for community 
social purposes. And, you know, heck, I mean, in uh, New York or London, I see schools being started in private apartment buildings yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we have so many, uh. so many schools that are being uh, empty, being disused, and they have been converted. Like the one in oh. uh, Upper East Coast was given to the uh, Hokkien Wee Kwan. Oh, it was okay. a secondary school, I think, uh, in Senate Estate. Yeah. Uh, secondary school being converted, used by... Hainan we uh, no Hokkien we Kwan Hokkien oh, we Kwan okay, okay. okay. Uh, sorry for the slip I said Hainan because I'm Hainanese but actually it's Hokkien we Kwan right right uh, <laughs> so this is where we can use the schools to reduce the class size right right okay okay I, I think I've taken up enough let's uh, of your time let's let's talk to uh, the uh, audience who have sent in a lot of questions. Uh, Nailin Than asks, does the geography of Singapore influence the way the government manages reserves? Because as much as comparisons are made of Hong Kong and the West, Singapore is admittedly constrained in resources. Yes, so what is I, the pressure? I think the, the point is Singapore doesn't have natural resources, oh, right? I see, doesn't uh, have natural resources. I, I guess Hong Kong doesn't either, but Western countries, when you talk about, yeah. say, if we talk about Norway, they have oil. Yeah. We talk about, you know, Dubai, they two have... Questions. Oh, there's a, a two questions. Okay, can Tham and Tanji say, chip in their opinion about hiding the value of Singapore reserves as a form of national security? Uh, this is something that the government has always used that they do not want to tell the people how much we have because it will, it, it will protect our national security. But I think that's, that's a false dichotomy. Firstly, Singapore dollar is not an international currency. The supply of Singapore dollar is limited. Mm -hmm. It's limited. And when you want to attack the Singapore dollar, you need supplies of Singapore dollar, right? To right. sell, to short the Singapore dollar. But it's limited. I think there is only $42 billion in cash in the Singapore, being circulated in Singapore oh, economy. Okay. That's very little. Yeah. Even if George Soros were to speculate against the Singapore dollar with $42 billion, we have a lot of money to protect us, right. ourselves, to, to fight against him. He will okay. never get away, okay. right? It is, um, you know, when I was in the civil service, we used to have this group of people telling us how, how should we protect the Singapore dollar against speculative attack. And we just smile, you know. No right. one, we, we, we have more than adequate resources to protect the Singapore dollar. Right. And the thing is, you only need to con concern about protecting the Singapore dollar if your dollar is weak, you know. But our dollar is not weak. Mm -hmm. Our dollar, in fact, the MAS uh, has always been trying to restrain the appreciation of Singapore dollar. So when I visited the Norway, uh, sovereign, Norwegian Sovereign Fund, the, uh, and I mentioned about this, they were just laughing it off, you know. Your dollar is not weak, so why are you worried at all? Mm -hmm. All right? So that two reasons. I think the third reason is that, you know, there is no point in hiding the reserves, the, num the true numbers of the reserve, because we, the figures are published, and we can estimate what the true, what the reserves is. We may not be exactly correct, but we can have the ballpark, which was what I tried to do. I tried in my second economic plan, calculated what the reserves, the size of the reserves is, and I come to the conclusion that it is about 1050, 1040 billion dollars, 1.0405 billion dollars, trillion dollars. So it is not difficult to estimate. A lot of the figures have been published. It's just a sum of three main sources. Reserves, the, the foreign exchange reserves of the MAS, then the, the net asset value of Tomasek, because this is company and the final figure which is the consolidated account of the Singapore government the finance ministry which is also published mm -hmm. so basically these are three published figures you have so they add up to about a trillion dollar billion dollar 
And it's a conservative estimate because the conservative account, consolidated account uh, is an account of funds that are not committed for use. And it excludes the balances, the surpluses kept by such three boards, and also the funds that have been allocated for specific use, like the Pioneer Generation Fund, the Mercator General Funds, the Long Term Care Generation, the Long Term Care Fund. These are not included. The government has diverted, set up all these funds. Uh, mm -hmm. For long, like the Pioneer Fund, $8 billion, but every year they are spending only about maybe $200 million, $200 million a year. So, but $8 billion has been siphoned off into, into a specific fund. So this is not, but the funds are being managed as well. The reserves are, they are being managed as part of the government money by GIC or so. So you have, uh, you can estimate. If I can estimate, there are much better analysts out there, financial analysts that who can come up to the same figure if they just bother to look hard enough, you know. I was, I was talking to one of the younger officers in the Ministry of Finance when I met them socially. I said, hey, why are you so secretive with the reserves? You know, why don't you just publish them? You know? And, he know, and you know what he told me? He said, Mr. Tan, all the figures are published. They are all here and there. You just need to piece them together, you get the total figure. You know, you get a total figure, which was what I tried to do. I just take from here, take from there, and piece together. So, whatever money we have is in the public record, and it's not difficult to estimate. Okay, cool. Um, there, so, a question from CJ, should ministers get bonuses? Uh, I'm not quite sure what he means by that. Well, the way it is done is that the Prime Minister get a maximum of six months yeah. bonuses and the ministers can get up to three months. Uh -huh. that, that's, uh, that's how the, they put in these bonuses because you know, they think that the, the ministers are underpaid. <laughs> that uh, in addition to, is to motivate them to work harder because that's the purpose of the bonus. Right. To give you motivation to work harder than, the, uh, 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 than you need. But I think we should not do this for public service. Yeah. Public service, you know there is a term, there's a rate for the job. What is the rate for the job? You should be paid adequately for what you put in to take care of your family commitments and to save for the future. But beyond that, your bonus is public service, that you have done your best for the people. Mm -hmm. That is the bonus that anybody who wants to go into public service should look forward to not a monetary bonus of mm. three months or six months or one month and all that. But of course, it is good for the Prime Minister that he can have the power, the leverage to tell which minister back up or be more loyal to me. Hmm. I mean, personally, I, I, I'm a bit suspicious of people who go into public service for the pay yeah. because it's going to affect the kind of decisions you make and the kind of things you, uh, you know, the values you have, the, the, the policies you have, right? Especially on based on how the bonuses are calculated yeah. because my understanding is they're tied to GDP and things like that. Yeah, at one stage it was so ridiculous that so long as the GDP exceeds a certain figure, I think it's 2%, then they get a national bonus, which is, right. I mean, they have even bonus, they've got different types of bonus. Yeah. They got the national bonus if the GDP exceeds by certain amount. I do not know whether this, Characterization is still being categorization is still being used, but yeah. at, well, I remember. They won't tell us. Yeah, they yeah. won't tell us. They will just now it's so simple. The top salaries of the top one thousand uh, earners, and then just take two thirds of that of the median salary of the top one thousand two thirds for one one third for sacrifice for <laughs> sacrifice, and then they get it back two thirds. Uh, this is crazy. Our, uh, the, the first generation, second generation of leaders, you know, came into politics and they took big pay cuts to come into exactly, politics. Exactly. I remember maybe even one minister, I think Mr. Lim Kim San, oh, uh, yeah. uh, did not take any salary because he was a rich man. Mm. He went to HDB, so he worked for free. Wow. Okay. So here's a comment from someone, and I think this is a, is a, would be a, a typical a response also from the PAP. 
which is uh, that I would rather not pay 30% tax to fund those who don't want to work. Right? He's challenging your argument that people from Western countries didn't become lazy because of big social welfare nets. So how would you respond to this? Well, I think basically I'm just trying to get what he's saying is the welfare system make people lazy. Yeah. Right? And uh, he would rather not pay 30% tax to fund those who don't want to work. Yeah. And that's what makes people lazy. There will be some people who will be lazy, who will spend time drinking in the pub and, uh, and whatever, okay? And doing, going to the gym rather than working. We, we won't rule out. There will be some such people. But by and large, overall, I think people are hardworking. They are reasonable people. Uh, they don't lace around, all right? The best way to discourage people from being lazy is actually social social norms, social behavior, social pressure. You know, they will have neighbors who will tell them that's the lazy one making use of the system. I think we should educate the people. We should have a system where a society which frowns upon such laziness taking advantage of the social system mm -hmm. in the West. I, I think it is happening. People you can't avoid you can't avoid such people. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's the normal distribution curve. Not everybody is on the curve. There will always be people who will be outside the curve. Right. Yeah? But also, I'm not sure his contention is right about the West because Scandinavian countries with strong social yeah. safety nets, European countries, Germany, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, they, they seem to be doing fine. So I think it's much too exactly. simplistic to simply say social welfare means lazy. And we've already talked about other problems with that sort of idea and yeah. mentality but ultimately it's also a sense of you need to trust your citizens exactly yeah. okay uh would mr tan say that gst adversely affects our tourism numbers and would gst revive our retail industry significantly i think it's, I think it's taking away gst oh yeah. would taking away gst revive our retail industry so uh, yeah, how does it affect tourism and would taking away GST revive our retail industry? Well, actually, uh, tourists don't, they can get a refund of the GST when they leave the country at the airport. So I think it is quite neutral in that sense. It is quite neutral in that sense. And the second part, like, would uh, taking away GST revive our retail industry? Do you think there's a, I guess, because if you think of GST yeah, as a tax I on consumption, would consumption increase if you take away GST? Yes, I think it will. In so far as the removal of GST makes things, goods and services cheaper at the retail level, obviously it will help because 7% and going to 9% within the next few years will definitely make things much more expensive. Mm. And we are talking about at the retail level, at the local economy level, at the neighborhood level, um, consumption is very price sensitive. Right. Okay, so the next two questions, thank you, is, is on the uh, $500 monthly payout, right? And maybe we can take them together because we're running out of time. James asks, what will be the effect of this $500 payout on the rate of inflation in Singapore? And Nailin Tan asks, does the $500 elderly scheme factor into Singapore's increasing aging population? Well, I think, um, I don't think the $500 payout will result in people consuming so much that they will push up the prices of retail goods. Um, we are talking about elderly people who are not going to jump out into the street and spend. All right. Um, and the second thing is that, uh, does, well, does the $500 per, for elderly factor into Singapore's increasing aging population? Well, we can only play with existing numbers. Yes, it will increase, but so will the returns on our investments, so will our reserves go up as well. Okay, thanks. Um, so, okay, so this uh, SNW, right, uh, this is another argument I think that the PAP makes that future investment returns, even if average over long run are uncertain, while 
social benefits are difficult to withdraw once publicly introduced. Could this be the reason why the incumbent, the PAP, is reluctant to introduce social benefits because there could be severe political backlash if any such program needs to stop? Well, I think, um, yes, the future is uncertain. We are talking about long-term rate of return, right? Returns may be 2% this year, may go up to 6% next year, or it may drop to minus 5% next year, all right? But what we are talking about is an average long-term rate. Uh, an average long-term rate of return so that averaging it out um, over 20 years for example the, G the Singapore government you defines long term in terms of the investment as 20 years I think 20 years return and you will find that they will average it out GIC managed to obtain I think it was 5.9 percent 5.7 or 5.9 percent over a 20-year period the last 20 years um, uh, the last uh, latest available year, all right. So five point seven or five point nine percent, regardless. And this, remember, the last twenty years we have, we have so many things happening. Right. We have the SARS yeah. in twenty o three, uh, two o three, and before that we have the dot com boom and bust. Best. Then uh, we have the two thousand and eight financial crisis, right. and. Uh, we have the oil crisis, the energy price crisis, and now we have the pandemic. So, but pandemic is later year, is uh, after that. But over the, there have been so many different economic crises, about four crises over a 20 year period. But GIC managed to obtain to achieve 5.7, 5.9% over this 20 year period. So we are talking about 4% per annum, taking 4% of the Taking 4% as the long-term, uh, average long-term return per year over 20 years. And if your reserves are a trillion dollars, $1,000 billion, $1, billion, a 4% return every year represents $40 billion returns, returns on the investment. So we can fund on this basis, that 4% basis, even if returns are uncertain, but over the long term, do not be afraid if returns drop to 2% or drop to minus 1% or 0% because the following year, it will be made up. Right. The returns will go up to... It's like the Norwegian Sovereign Fund. Last year, they achieved 19% return. 19%. You find that even minus 4%, you have 15% buffer, which you can spread out over the next few years. So do not be afraid. Take a look at it long term. All right? Look at it long term. People who have invested in the stock market knows that over the long term, even if you take Wall Street, uh, the Dow Jones, the index, they have been on the uptrend. Right. Cool. Okay. Uh, let's uh, last question here from Kenneth Anthony, who asks about Lawrence Wong saying that we should share the cost of the vaccine. Why is it not in the interest of public health care and society to vaccinate everybody for free? <laughs> well, I think um, I would be in favor of that giving it for free because especially China has said that if it discovered the vaccine, it will just provide free to the rest of the world. Uh, I think it's very generous of China to say that. And if we get it free, we should get it free too. I mean, basically, why should the government charge for something that it has got it for free from China? Right. Right. But even if the government has to pay for it, uh, do you think that, you know, because it's, this is a, a public health issue, should they provide it for free or, uh, you know, because the, the whole issue of health care, yeah. right, and about cost, about exposing people to some costs, co-payments, but with this, it's a pandemic. So yes. even if the government has to pay for it, should it, should it just be provided free? Well, I'm in favor of that, or at least just a nominal charge. Right. Uh, just a nominal charge. Uh, so it is not something that uh, we can prevent. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, it just hits us. Yeah. You know, we can take preventive measures wearing the mask and safe distancing, but we cannot really protect ourselves fully, totally from this, ep uh, from this epidemic. Mm -hmm. So I'm in favor of giving it free. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, so so many questions I actually still want to ask you but we're out of time so I'm going to give you the last question I ask everyone right you're running 
you're running in my constituency, Kuala ah, Lumpur team, mm. um, and why should or make your pitch to the voters of Holland Bukit team uh, you're running against Vivian Balakrishnan yeah. and his team right uh, why should they vote for you in Holland Bukit team why should the voters of Holland Bukit team uh, vote for you and the STP instead of Vivian Balakrishnan and the PAP yeah. make your pitch to voters the problems facing people the voters of Holland Bukit team uh, GRC are common to the problems faced by other Singaporeans in our GRC. We are a small country and in fact the GRCs are arranged in such a way that they are quite homogeneous They reflect the Singapore society as a whole. This is the, this is the rationale for the PAP when they organize it in such a way because they believe the majority of people still want the PAP government. So they try to replicate the national profile onto the GRC. Obviously, there are limitations for doing that because uh, some constituencies are predominantly public housing, uh, like I mean, Bedo, Tampines. There are very few public uh, private housing assets, but even then, they try to extend. Uh, uh, even our Juni, Porong Pase, they have some private condos and all that, trying to make it more approximate the national profile. National profile. Holland Bukit Timah has a large share of the private housing estate, uh, probably higher than more people. But on the whole, more constituencies, on the whole, it is a mixed constituency. You have lots of public housing estates in Gimo, in Bukimbang, Jiangjiang area, and a lot of the private housing estate, large, physically large area in Bukit Timah, Holland Road. But by and large, this, this pandemic has hit everyone, whether you are rich or poor, very badly. The poor are, of course, worse hit. Worse hit. But even the well-to-do are equally hurt. The professionals, those who have businesses to run, they are hurt as well. So, we will go to Parliament and make sure that the $100 billion that the government is going to spend benefits everyone not just ordinary yes the ordinary people those who need help must be helped but also the businessmen should need help as well you know mm -hmm. especially the small and medium-sized industries we want them to prosper so that they in turn can help other people you are not being discriminated against by electing us you will we will make sure that your care your needs are taken care of through the hundred million dollars and through the jobs that are going to be created, hundred thousand new jobs and traineeships that are going to be, the, to be created. This is our solemn promise to you. And there are certain specific areas as well in Holland, Bukitima, especially the older housing estates, those in the Federal Road, um, Empress Garden area, the four old blocks that I visited. They are very old, they are 40 years old, and they have been asking for lift upgrading on every floor, but this has not been done. To add insult into injury, they arranged a dialogue in March, but then was postponed because of COVID-19. This dialogue was to discuss about lift upgrading, but why has it taken so long? Since 2011, Vivian Balakrishnan and his team have got nine years to prepare for these old estates who are more than 30 years old in 2011 and now more than 40 years old now and yet they are without lift upgrading this hurts the elderly residents in these estates so i'm going to take care of specific issues as well as national issues for the voters of holland bukitima one particular national issue i want to bring up is to question the, the traditional economic model of Singapore, of the PAP government, which is based prim, uh, predominantly on relying cheap foreign workers to sustain economic growth. This is a third world economic model, which we try to, to um, avoid, which we try to, to plan away. I was in the government service in, late, uh, in the late 1970s, Remember, we have this 1979 economic plan, the so-called second industrial restructuring. Uh, we were supposed to go on to a higher wage economy, 
um, and we introduced a wage correction because wages were too low and because of too low employers are under no pressure to upgrade their industries and to make the, the people the workers more productive so we designed a wage increase of 20% per annum for three years in total 60% to bring up the wages of our workers but in subsequent years this policy was not followed instead the government took the easy way out of opening up the doors to more foreign workers to bring and which result in depressing the wages of our workers but do not get me wrong i am not against the foreign workers we need foreign workers to for the economy uh, we need workers with the right skills to complement us and we need workers who foreign workers to do the jobs that singaporeans do not want to do all right we need those two categories of people but we must not open the door so widely that any tom dick and harry can come and because too big an influx of foreign workers will cause overcrowdedness and in addition to depressing the wages of our workers we need the foreign workers but not too many of them Germ other countries like germany have been able to achieve high wage economy a productive economy with only a 0.5 percent increase in the workforce we should aim for that they depended on foreign workers but only such a small number increase and yet they can achieve uh, maintain high wages for the people alongside foreign workers a high standard of living this is the goal that we should strive towards too and this election will give you a chance to elect people into parliament who will question this third world economic model of the PAP and go on to a first world model of uh, of high wage for our workers and a high productivity productivity economy for our people use this chance to elect us in who will who will fight for you for a first world economic model thank you thank you very much you say thank you very much for coming here live on our show yeah. you know uh, I, I've said this to every every person here but it does take a lot of courage to come here live and be interviewed um, and and knowing that it will be recorded and broadcast and recorded permanently on the internet and I really appreciate you coming here and yes. and being willing to answer all my questions and I've certainly learned a lot yeah. uh, and all the best to you for for your for your uh, election campaign thank you yeah. PJ just one final word oh, sure. if you may sure. the PAP is asking for unity asking for your votes to give a strong mandate they will get a mandate but don't give what they really want is a blank check from you please do not let them to wipe out the opposition in this election this is a real possibility that the opposition will wipe out because of what PAP has done giving you a hundred billion dollar and promising you a hundred thousand jobs but your biggest insurance your biggest insurance that they will do what they promise to do is to vote more opposition members of parliament we especially at sdp we have the right people who who were asked who dare to ask probing questions of the pap with regards to the economy and with regards to social policies please give us your vote vote sdp <laughs> thanks gc thank you okay and thank you to all of you who tuned in and asked questions and of course, uh, you know, a, a big invitation to any political candidate who wants to come on the show, uh, PAP, not PAP, anyone. Um, I would love to talk to any of you any time of day. Just let Terry know. If you'd like to know more about the election, uh, do check out his coverage on the online, onlinecitizenasia.com, newnarrative.com slash sgelections. Um, and we'll be back uh, to tomorrow, Terry. Yeah, tomorrow with um, yes, more yes. live interview. Oh, the PS, the Progress Singapore Party. Exciting! I haven't managed to talk to any of them yet. So we'll see all of you tomorrow uh, in the afternoon for um, our next edition of the live show. Thank you very much, everyone. Good afternoon.